Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that is passing wisdom to the next generation of athletes, coaches, and parents to transform leaders on and off the court. And in today's episode, we have a very special guest, the 2022-2023 Nebraska Teacher of the Year, Renee Jones. In our conversation today, we dive into her philosophy on connection before curriculum. It's an outstanding episode for coaches and parents looking for teaching tactics and tips to to build deeper connections to expand our impact on youth. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Bridging Impact Podcast. Renee, I am thrilled to have you on. You are our first teacher of the year of a state on the show. So welcome to the show, Nebraska Teacher of the Year for those listening. So I'm excited to have our conversation. Yeah, thank thank you for having me. I didn't know I was your first state teacher of the year. So um, that's that's pretty cool. Out of uh, the 55 of us for 2023, I get to be the first. So that's awesome. There we go. All right. So let's dive right in with there. You know, a lot of times we actually focus, we get a lot of, you know, different coaches and leaders that are in the sports world, but coaching and teaching and even parenting all have, you know, similar running lines going through. And, you know, I got the opportunity to check out your Twitter and just see, you know, what you kind of all are about. And we have, we share a very similar mission. So I would love for you to, you know, share your journey and the beginning of what made you want to become a teacher and have an impact on the lives of youth. Yeah, of course. I think like so many teachers, um, this reoccurring theme throughout my life was just that I had impactful teachers. So my parents went through a divorce when I was in fourth grade and it was Miss Goodrich who was like the constant in my life. Her classroom was the same, you know, her hugs in the morning were the same, but like my family was moving and my dad was no longer living with us. And it was just became this like place of comfort. And then the same thing happened in seventh grade um, when I, I had another really impactful teacher and that that middle school teaching happened to be my English teacher. And then again, my freshman year, I had a teacher set me aside and he was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You're acting like a complete fool in class, but then you're turning in this like amazing work. Like, why are you ashamed of this? And it was kind of the first time an adult like stopped and was just like, gave me pause or almost just gave me permission to be academic or to be this person I wanted to be. And it just kind of always made me think. Um, and, and then for me, I had, I have a little brother and he's two years younger than me and he had some mental health struggles and he had a very different experience in school than I did. And for the most part, I got friends pretty easily. My teachers, I always felt like they liked me. Um, I wasn't in the administrator's office, you know, like I, I followed, I, I, I followed, I don't want to say follow orders, but I followed the directions and I was a good, I was a good student. I was, you know, even on the road. Um, but my brother, he, he didn't have that experience and, um, he had, and I watched some people really help him. I watched a custodian befriend him and stay after school to help him with homework and to help him, um, you know, after he had like an episode where he needed to pay back the school some money and, um, just these people that were either very supportive of him or really dismissive of him. And I thought to myself of like, why are they treating us so differently? Like what, what's different about my brother and I, um, and the people that really made an impact on him, um, really had a profound impact on our entire family, on, on me as the older sister, on my mom. And, um, and that was profound to me. And so I actually started my journey with youth as a social worker. I worked in a variety of residential treatment facilities here in Nebraska. And then I actually lived in San Francisco for five years and I did that work there. Um, but unfortunately, these, these, these centers kept losing funding. And so I was just kind of like, dang, how do I support kids and love on kids but that I don't have to worry about being without a job every year. And then I joked with my husband, I was like, well, they're never gonna shut down the schools. So I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll be a teacher. Um, and I, I liked English and that felt like a strength to me. And I knew that high school was kind of my jam. And so that's kind of this like way of how I got to be where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, 
it's, it's the path, right? It's the, you know, one thing to the next. And I actually share a similar thing. Like I started in boys and girls club, like before even coaching sports and like wanting to give back and just be a positive role model and then running like a basketball program and kind of having things kind of layer. And so with that and with where you are now in your journey, it sounds like a lot of your journey, especially as a teacher and wanting to just give back to youth in general um, stems from, you know, some of the positive influences like that, you know, a couple of teachers that you had that, that mm-hmm. constant, that consistency, what kind of traits did you know that you wanted to embody when you um, were a, a leader for youth? Yeah. So I know that I am the best version of myself and then like give back the most, whether that be to my own children or, um, now to like a bunch of like pre-service teachers that I have the opportunity to like in any capacity, whether it's my students, my whomever, it's that like, I'm just going to own me. Like I am just kind of this loud, quirky, like I'm the teacher that's dancing in the hallway or like I wear all kinds of goofy hats. And I just like, when I gave myself permission to just like show up as me, then I find that like my connections are more authentic. I care a little bit deeper because I'm not wearing the like, oh my gosh, are they going to like this lesson? Or, oh my gosh, some of these freshmen are probably going to laugh at me or whatever it is. And and I just accept that like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to be everybody's favorite teacher. And that's okay because lucky for us, the kids get to have many different teachers, you know, and they get to learn from all of us. And so when I stopped trying to be whatever I thought everybody's persona of me was, should be, um, then I feel like I made really deep connections with kids and I was having fun. I was, I just genuinely have fun at work every day. Um, and most of that's because I'm just kind of, a, I'm just kind of goofy a little bit. Um, and I'm just trying to find the joy. So I mean, that's a, that's really relatable for me because I feel like, and, and I'm just curious, you know, like as a, I'm sure when you were a young teacher and you were kind of like, you know, still trying to like find yourself, right? Like there was probably these moments of like, you want to let at the beginning, you wanted to let out your goofy side, but you're like, oh, I got to be professional and, you know, kind of rigid and they're not going to take me serious or I don't know what your journey exactly looked like, but I know I share similar experiences of, you know, I, I am, I'm also goofy. Like I'm also loud and, you know, kind of, you know, quirky with just the way I move and and the way I am. Um, and so for someone, you know, I've also struggled with my own in terms of like, I guess, confidence in that, right. Mm -hmm. Because it's different. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, kind of like you talk about a little bit of that people pleaser. So for those like, you know, young, young teachers, young coaches, even young parents that are kind of like, you know, in similar boats, like how did you kind of navigate that uh, space to become like your authentic self as a teacher to, it sounds like to actually like, you know, build deeper connections. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, it was a roller coaster, right? And to be very honest, I, I still don't get it perfect when I was named the teacher of the year. And then I'm getting like, all these things thrown at me that I've never had before, I have this moment of like, well, what's the right response? And so I'm like, once I get past, well, what's the right response and what's the like Renee response, um, then I can show up better um, and give better to kids. And so I think, I think it's like having these moments of reflection, like when I take the time or build in the system to like reflect. And for me, I like writing. And so I like to journal um, and I, I just I write and I'm a better person when I take the time to do that, because then I'm thinking about like, well, how did I show up in this space and how did how did that feel? You know, like, was I worried about like, well, what are they doing down the hall? Or how is this person integrating it? And if it's not coming from a like curious, how do I become better and use their strengths to like supplement my strengths when it's more just about like, oh, what are they, what are they going to think of me? Or who am I going to upset? And of course, all of that's important and you need to be a professional as a teacher. And I'm not, I'm not at all saying I'm like, I'm just, you know, a bag of jokes in class all day. But um, it's just like accepting like the way that I'm going to do English 9 is going to be a little bit different than how they do it down the hall. Our objectives are still going to be met. Our, you know, like the, 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 the things are going to happen, um, but the little nuances of how I'm going to go about that are going to be a little bit different. And I think that's really beautiful. And our kids need to see that. Um, and I think there's so much power in that. 
right? There is power in them getting the opportunity to work with different teachers, with different personalities. And then, you know, my follow-up question when I was, you know, kind of learning more about you and your philosophy is like, one of the things that you talked about is like challenging, you know, students to kind of reach their potential, right? Yeah. See things that they may not be able to see. So I'm curious how you balance, right? That, you know, fun, loving personality with, you know, someone who wants to challenge their students to kind of continue to have that growth mindset to keep reaching, you know, another level, whether it's in reading or writing or math. Yeah. Yeah. I think the grace and accountability balance is very, a very real struggle. And I think when you go into it with the mindset of like, yes, you need to learn all of your students' names. You need to know how to pronounce them. You should know something about them, right? You need to make those connections. But when you remind yourself that like the greatest impact and connection you can make is through your instruction. When I can show kids the power of reading or, you know, I've taught public spe speaking course for many years and a lot of the kids are really dismissive and they're just like, man, Jones, I'm not going to be standing on some stage talking to some 500 people. And I'm like, maybe not. Right. But you will be in a job interview one day and you'll need to use these skills in this moment and making those connections. And then when you can like just having the courage to not give up on a kid or to just push them and just being like, dude, I know you can do better than this. Like, can you, and, and giving them like a tangible, like tiny percent um, change because, you know, when I was early on in my career, I'd be like, dude, your claim, it's not there. You need to have evidence, like go back. What are you doing? Um, and I would get frustrated. And what I realized is like, I'm not breaking this down enough. I'm, I'm giving them, you know, I'm, I'm thinking they have these executive functioning skills. But they, they just don't yet. And so when I learned to intentionally teach those kinds of things and learned to teach a student how to student before I could teach them my English content, then I had you know, a lot of those expectations just kind of were raised. Um, and it's it's an ebb and flow kind of a thing. And every year the kids are a little bit different and you have to do that a little bit different. Um, and I think that's beautiful and really challenging all, all at the same. So um, I think if you just go into it knowing that like, this is going to be an imperfect storm, then um, yeah. It's better. And and what I think to myself is, you know, I have I have four children of my own. Three of them are in school and one is um, got a year left in preschool. And I always you know, I had somebody, a mentor say to me of like, well, Renee, what would you want to know about your kid if they were having a hard day or they're crying in class because their boo broke up with them? You know, is that something you want to know as a parent? It's not really have any influence on their academics, you know, long term, but maybe, um, you know, is that, is that something you want to know about? Or um, as a student, like, what are the nudges that you needed? And so when I make it personal, um, and I remind myself that like, yeah, I serve 140 kids every single day, but those are somebody's babies, and somebody's most prized possession. And if I want to know about it as a mom, then somebody else probably thinks the same way. Um, and so I try to, I try to remind, remind, remind myself of that as well. Right. And they're someone's babies and they're just someone, right? Yeah, they're not true. just a number. And I think, you know, so with that being said, like one of the things that, you know, I, you know, was immediately, you know, connected with was you're talking about connection before curriculum. Yeah. And, you know, I have a couple of follow-up questions around the science of teaching but before we get there before we even get to the teaching of the subject you know I would love for you to kind of you know continue to expand and elaborate on the you know your priority of connection over curriculum yeah I think at least in, in my experience that it can as a teacher at times feel overwhelming about how am I going to get all these benchmarks met how am I going to get through all of these units of study how am I how am I going to meet all of the goals right so like I teach freshmen and if I don't teach them something and it's like this with everyone not just with freshmen like if they don't get how to write a nuanced claim or an annotated bibliography then like that's a skill that they're going to need, you know, sophomore year. If someone is like this, they're building blocks. And so they're going to know like, well, Jones didn't do her part or what have you. Um, but I think it's really important that, like you said, that we remember that like, these are people first. And so I think it's so important. And I just had to like have this thing I can say in my head when it's like, 
is it frustrating when your student comes in eight minutes, 12 minutes, four minutes late every single day because they're outside talking to their buddies in the hallway? Yeah, it is, right? It's infuriating. And also, I think it's really important to model that like, I first am gonna say, hey, hey, Johnny, like, I'm so glad to have you in class and then walk over him and to be like, my guy, you are missing X, Y, Z. This is why it's important. Like old conversations need to be had. It's still important that he is, he's still hold, held to the same standard to meet these objectives. But also if I don't treat him like a human, how would I ever expect him to, to show up and to want to do the work? I'm like, <clears throat> If I came to work one day, right, and my admin it showed up and they're like, but Jones, did you get your uh, your reflection evaluation thing done? And they didn't say hi to me at first. In my head, I would be like, he really didn't even ask me about my day. Or if my son was sick, like what he doesn't, he doesn't know. He knows Maverick's been sick for days, you know? So it's just like, just personalize it and just treating these kids like we want to be treated and forgetting that like, they're not just students, you know, and we know that we're teachers, but in the day to day grind, man, we just, it just gets busy. And so we just forget these like tiny little things that we can do um, to, to, to just kind of like build these little connections. Yeah, a thousand percent. I mean, as I hear you talking, I like hear myself going through practice, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need to do this, this and this. And like, I don't have time, like you're late already. Yeah. And we needed you here. But, um, you know, it's like, obviously we want to hold them to that standard, like to be on time. That way we can prepare them for life in like showing up on time to interviews and, you know, making sure that they're successful in jobs later on. But it's also being like, all right, it's, it's great to have you here. Like, I'm, you know, how was your lunch and, or, or whatever it is. And so, you know, that those connections are building trust. And I'm sure, you know, with, when it comes to, you know, being a teacher and right, when you get the opportunity to teach and, you know, 140 students like throughout the year, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of our, a great teacher, a great coach is to build that trust, that relationship mm -hmm. um, with those students so that, you know, as they go along, they can see like, hey, all right, Miss Jones, she, she really wants us to succeed by the end of the year. And so I'm curious, you know, as far as, you know, when it comes to building trust and relationship building, what are, you know, a couple of things that have surprised you um, in your experience as a teacher that, you know, has really helped you form, you know, different relationships with maybe some of your more challenging students? Yeah, I think figuring out a way um, to redirect kids in private. And when I first learned that, like praise in public, redirect in private, right? Like I'm sure we've heard that phrase, but when you're pulling kids out to the hallway to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation, people still know they're being redirected, right? The kids still still know that. And so then as, as a teacher, a freshman, I get like, oh, or Jones got, you know, there's like all this commentary going on. And so we have to be a little bit creative. And so like, I'll, I'll put a sticky note on their desk or I'll like write something on their paper or, you know, just like trying to find different ways or like sending them an email like, hey, can you, can we chat after class? Like you're not in trouble and nothing's wrong, but just trying to figure out ways. And, and some of that's knowing your students, right? Because I've got students that unless they're prompted, they're not checking their school email. That's just not their go-to communication. And so it's just like trying to rethink of how am I going to get, how am I going to get connected with this kid? How am I going to have this conversation? Because I think it's really important that we had the conversation and almost always, if we have the hot conversation, we're closer afterwards, right? So if I have to talk to a kid of like, dude, your, your homework's not done, or I see that you're on your phone again, like one, is everything okay? Are, are you doing okay? Um, or same, like if a kid's got their head down, my first question to them is always like, hey, are you feeling okay? Did you get something to eat? You know, like those kinds of things before I'm like, dude, get your head up. What are we doing? You know, um, and, and that's hard. I think that takes a lot of intention, especially if it's the same kid, like every single day with their head down um, to just go They're like, first, I want you to hear, I care about you. And also let it, let's get going. Like we've got things to do. Um, you're important. You are worth an education. Like let's, let's get here to do something today. Um, and so I think it's just these really small steps and I think reaching out to home can be a, a, a way to build trust. Um, if, uh, you know, like if they see that you care enough to like call their parent, you know, in that moment, they're gonna be like, don't you call my dad. You know, he's gonna be so mad. I'm gonna get my phone taken away. 
And also that's just a reminder of like, we can, we can joke and we can have fun. And also I'm still your mentor. I'm still your teacher. It's still my job to teach you these lessons, even if they're hard, you know? Um, and so I think it's just the, the little ways we show up and also, you know, and, and this is going to vary with com different people are comfortable in different ways, but I share stories with them, you know, like I share vulnerable moments and it doesn't have to be my deep, dark secrets, right? I can share vulnerability about the time my nine month old golden retriever got out of her harness. And like, I look like a crazy person, you know, running around trying to catch my dog. I get, you know, there's a lesson in these things and, and they're funny and I'm showing them like, Hey, I'm going to take a risk and tell you this story. Um, and there's so much beauty that comes from them. And then they feel closer to you as well. Um, and I also just do really goofy things like freshmen love scratch and sniff stickers. It doesn't make sense, but you can buy like a hundred of them on Amazon for like eight bucks. And if you put like a, and then if you let them choose, like they just little things like that, like they're still kids, you know, they still want those those things and those, that reassurance. Um, and I'll be like, put this on the fridge. Like your folks are going to be so proud of you or do, you know, like I'm, ch I'm cheering you on. Or in high school, I get the benefit of like, you know, if they're in a play or if they're in a sport, I mean, if you show up to those things, those kids know, they, they know who is showing up. And I understand that not everybody has the time to do that and that's okay. But just like these little nuance, or even if you know, they had a game and you, you, you know, you ask them these things. Um, I think all of those tiny little things really just help build those building blocks. That makes a, a lot of sense. And especially when we're having those challenging conversations, right? If the more we can kind of put into the trust bank with, you know, I remember my English teacher, my senior year, you know, she like congratulated us after we won, you know, a, a, playoff game right and she brought it into the attention because it's me and my buddy were in the class and you know so it's like it feels good right to have you know that that mentor that teacher coach um you know recognize you and, and see that you know obviously that they care about what's going on in, in in your life and so you know the the story aspect of it i think is really important and really powerful and you touched on vulnerability and so that's something i think really is especially important to connect with people right to share you know that you know hey you know mr Furtado, coach Furtado, he's not perfect right he messes up you know he's you know chasing his dog around looking like a fool or you know miss jones is you know right doing this doing similar things so can you talk about how you create and, and you know make sure that vulnerability is a part of your you know i guess teaching philosophy yeah i think it's like you take something that's important to you or you're passionate about and you make it a connection to like the skill that you're trying to teach them because oftentimes like the skill of the executive functioning skill is often harder than like constructing the paragraph that I'm asking the kids to do just like an English correlation. Right. So it's like, if I know you're a ball player that I can just be like, Hey, what happens if you don't show up to practice every day? Or like what, you know, like uh, and just making connections about things that they care about so that they can see like a correlation um, and just kind of like understanding that like all these little steps matter. And the same with I'm like, you know, or I had a ton of these examples as teacher of the year this year where I was like, you guys, I had to stand on a stage in front of 700 people and this is how I felt. And it was really scary. And then show them a small clip of like, these are the things that I'm doing that are really scary. Um, but they're important because of X, Y, Z, you know, it's just that storytelling and connecting it to what's important to them. Um, you know, or just like, even it's, you know, they've got a sibling and I'm like, Hey, remember when like your sibling shows up in your room and like leaves the door open and doesn't do all these things. Like when you're storming into my room and you're disrupting, you know, the, the, the learning environment, like this is what's going on. They're like, yeah, that's annoying. You know, so it's so like making those small, subtle connections. And it's like, I'm not calling them out. I'm letting them come to this idea kind of on their own. I'm just like guiding them to get to this light bulb moment. Um, and sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't, but it's just like trying. And then if it doesn't, like I will, I will tell the kids, I'm like, well, eh, that was, that was where I fell flat. I'm sorry. And I'll try again. And, and then I, that, that in itself is its own lesson of like taking a risk and being vulnerable. And so, yeah. Right. 
No, that's great. And I think that's a great segue in terms of, you know, my curiosity in terms of like, I feel like with everything, right, whether it's parenting, coaching, teaching, it all like when you're teaching, it's, it, it's all teaching. Like yeah. I think of myself as like basketball is a sport that I teach. And so when you are teaching English, um, like what are some of the you know best practices for helping, you know, different students learn and then students that are, you know, I'm sure in certain classes you have, you know, more proficient readers and then less proficient readers. And how do you make sure that you keep them all engaged? Yeah, I think uh, for me, I, you know, I went to this this year and I don't know why I didn't think of it all, uh, like nine years ago, but like I intentionally placed my kids in pods. And so they're facing each other. They're not facing me. And it's just just like their seating arrangement. It's just like well, they're probably going to talk to each other. They're facing each other. It's going to be weird if they're not going to talk to each other, right? It's just kind of like, for a, like lack of better words, like it's just like forcing them to converse. And so then it's also really easy for me to have an elbow partner or in your pod or, you know, like kind of those different things. And, and for me, I just, on day one, we are up moving and we are talking to people because I want them to just know like, when we enter 318, you know Jones is just going to be obnoxious and start dancing until we all just get into the circle or like we just all do it. And like they joke about it, but it's like and some of them rolls their eyes and a lot and some of the kids absolutely hate it. But many of them, they like it, you know, and it, they're collaborative learning. And really this bred from a frustration of cell phones. And I was like, the more I have them moving and the more I have them talking with people, the less they're spending on their phones um, for me. And so that works for me um, most of the time. It's not a, you know, it's not a perfect system. Um, and so I think that was, that was a fundamental change of just like something really simple, change the seating arrangement so that they're just talking to each other more um, so that they're just more engaged. It was just like this really simple thing that just kind of worked for me. Um, I also, the last few years implemented something I call um, the success criteria. And since I teach mostly freshmen, it finally hit me. And this was like post a post COVID change where it was like, I was finding myself more and more like having to explicitly teach a student how to have an elbow share, right? I think like in high school, we so often are like, hey, with your elbow partner, tell them about, you know, something you did on Sunday or something like that. And we just assume that these kids know how to say like, hey, I'm Renee and on Sunday I did X, Y, Z, you know, like we just assume that they know how to like make eye contact or nod when somebody's talking, like all of these social skills and post COVID when a lot of these kids weren't, or we were telling them, you know, sit forward, do not touch with, you know, do not go. We're just like contradicting everything. And we just assume that like, we're just going to pick up and it just wasn't the case. And I think that that feels really weird to say out loud. So like on my slides and I use Google slides for everything, you know, I have like a column that always was like what I call the success criteria. So in order to feel success and to be successful in whatever we're doing in that moment, these are the things that you need to do. So like your cell phone's going to be out, you're facing forward, you're turned in talking to your part, whatever it is. And so I'm just like explicitly teaching it. And for me, I've got to have it on a slide because otherwise I get excited or I get moving around and I have the best of intentions, but I just forget to tell the kids like these things because I already know most of the time, you know, how to turn and talk to somebody and like make that small conversation. But some of them just don't. Um, and so I have to remind myself to remind the kids and then I try to model it and, um, and then it's cool because then as the weeks go by, you can kind of up the ante a little bit, right? So now, you know, when, when I'm asking you to elbow talk, you're facing each other, but then we can like take it a little bit further. And then we're just engaging in deeper discussions because if the kid doesn't know these like quote unquote, simple social skills, they might just check out, right? They start scrolling or their heads down or they're in the bathroom for 40 minutes or whatever it is, or they're just like not engaged. Um, and it's not a cure all, uh, but I think it, it helps. And then if you're just saying it to the whole class and you're modeling it with different people, then it's not a, like, I'm not calling you out. Like you don't know how to talk to somebody like that's weird. No, it's just like a, we don't know how to, how to talk. And, and I put it on me. Like I tell them funny stories about how I couldn't ask somebody to homecoming when I was in sophomore year, you know, um, and try to relate to them that way. So. Gotcha. No, that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, I actually had the same thing, like, since this was my first year coaching 
high school basketball is my actually first year coaching like a team yeah. since the pandemic. And so I'd be like, let's give ourselves, you know, high fives and high fives and get stuff in the line. And they just walk right by each other, no high fives. And one of the things was that I actually had a conversation with someone on the podcast about this. They're like, well, Justin, you know, they didn't, right. they weren't allowed to high five each other for, you know, a couple of years. So like, they don't know what that's like. And I think really recognizing the modeling it. And I think modeling just the simple things. And I still have this, right? Like I just ran a camp this week talking about leadership and, you know, I'm, you know, very reflective like you and thinking about all, oh, I need to model it more, right? I think I'm almost assuming too much. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I guess it's, it's a learning experience, right? Figuring out, okay, I need to model this. And, and how, how do you make sure that, you know, because I know for me, um, and maybe this is something we just got to get over, but like, it just seems so simple sometimes, right? Like, oh, I, why, why do I need to teach this, right? right. Yeah, and it, I, think, I think you're right. We just assume that people know what we know and, or just like that they are, because I am a person that like, if I don't know something, I'm going to read about it. I'm going to, you know, learn about it. And it's like, we have Google at our fingertips. So it's just, it's there getting information. It's not the problem, but like, we have to remember to teach our kids how to access information and how to like look for credible sources and know when something is, you know, good or not as good or when to question things. Um, and it's the same with social skills and like how great would it have been for me in high school if somebody would have sat me down and like, or just like slowly taught me about things about like, etiquette about, I don't know, like, when do you wait someone out of the bathroom? How long is too long? When do you call? Like all of these little things that you just kind of like flop and figure out, but some people, you know, don't, or I learned a lot because I had a job in high school or, you know, we had these experiences. I was in a few sports and those kinds of things. But I think it's like, mm -hmm. if we can kind of help our kids, like learn these things and, you know, position them as capable, position them successful, then I think we can continue to raise the bar um, academically and, and socially. Um, and I think especially it's just like knowing your kids, you know, it's like the expectations I have for freshmen last year, I had some seniors and my seniors, they were very different, you know, because they had done, you know, my seniors that this is not their first rodeo. They're about to like, quote unquote, go out to the real world, you know, so it's like the, the things that they need to learn they're different. The same with like, you know, I have a fifth grader at home, a third grader and a first grader of like the things that I'm teaching them are very different. And also sometimes the same because none of them can seem to put the lid back on the peanut butter jar. So we have to revisit that very often, you know, so it's like, you just have to know your kids and it's a lot of work. Um, you know, but I read this somewhere, somebody said, and I can't remember who, but it's like, and I'm sure most people have heard this, but you're going to take the time anyways, right? You're going to take the time to redirect them. You're going to take the time to have the conversations. You're going to take the time and frustration. Um, so it's like pre-correction takes just as much time as redirection. And so it's just like, where do you want to spend your time? For me, pre-correction is way more fun, right? I can make that goofy. I can tell a story. I can do all of these things. Redirection is exhausting. When I have to redirect all day, I leave school feeling defeated. That's when I start hating my job. You know, like they, I go through these ruts of like, you know, just because I'm teacher of the year doesn't mean I've never had a hard semester or a ha hard day where I've left crying that like teaching is the best. Teaching is the best, but I have hard days. But most of that, when I think back, it's because I spent most of the day, like, please put your head up, please put your phone away, calling parents. And like, even if you pre-correct and you do quote unquote, all of the things, you're still going to have a kids that have hard days and struggle. But can you imagine what the feeling would be if you're only having five of those conversations a day versus like 95, you know, um, it would be, it, it's very different feeling. That is a different feeling. And I think about that in the same way of when I'm coaching, it's like setting out reminders, right? I think, you know, a lot of times as coaches are, we just react to a mistake, right? That our, our player made when in reality, we could have gave them, you know, a reminder, hey, keep your hands up or, you know, simple things yeah. like that. And so, you know, with that being said, and, you know, kind of entering this, you know, kind of last chapter of our podcast, we want to keep it in the English um, world is, you know, with obviously the pandemic and a ton of things have changed, I'm sure there are a lot of similarities in teaching, but can you talk about some of the, the differences and, and maybe the challenges of, of teaching and connecting with youth post pandemic? 
Yeah, I think the idea of reintroducing collaborative learning has been challenging um, and kind of like what we were just talking about, like teaching kids how to interact when people were, you know, like we were in our houses and we were just told like, don't go near each other. Like, here's the one way hallway. Don't look at each other, wear your mask, you know, and then we just kind of stripped it all away and assumed that everybody, adults included, like feel comfortable going back to quote unquote normal. Some of these kids, they don't, they never knew high school, what high school was normal. They don't know, they don't, they don't have a frame of reference like many adults do. Um, and I think it's on top of that, COVID brought this interesting, not all bad, like era of technology that we have never seen before. And that's both really powerful and scary. And, you know, I've been spending quite a bit of time this week in particular, but over the summer of like, reflecting on my semester from last year. And I was for the first time had AI, you know, my students used AI bots to su support their, you know, their papers and such. And so my husband's a software engineer and I just, so I, I lean on him for a lot of this and I was just like, I don't know how we combat this. This feels exhausting to me. I don't know. And I have, I feel awful like asking a kid, is this an AI? You know, like that feels like a very accusatory, sometimes I'll get it wrong conversation. I was like, I don't know what to do. Um, and my husband is like, why are you fighting it? The world is changing. And so then it became this, I was walking that dog um, and I was like, what do I do? And I was like, you know what we need to do? I need to figure out ways to integrate chat GPT or like the snap AI into my classrooms. Like how can this chat like take on a different characteristic view or how can I say, Hey, chat GPT bot, give me, you know, an analysis of X, Y, Z. And then you tell me why or why not the chat got it right or wrong. You know? So it's like, one, I'm showing the kids of like, hey, I, I see you. I see this technology that you're already going to use. Because the reality is they're going to use it. They're going to use it either way. So I can either help them learn it or use it to their, like, learn some positives about it. Um, or I can spend my time trying to figure out if this person used, you know, an AI bot. And so that's that's a new challenge for me. And I think that was, you know, um, a product of the pandemic. I'm sure they were working on AI before, but you know, I think we just exacerbated a few things. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, how do we use this to meet our objectives and to support kids? Because, I mean, I took my kids through a McDonald's the other day and it was an AI bot that took our order. It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't a person. And my first thought was like, oh my God, you're taking jobs away from people. This is terrible. Um, and my husband's like, this is the future. Like we can't, you know, you can't fight it. It's just, and so, whether we have personal feelings or not about, you know, kids should just know how to talk to each other or technology, you know, I'm just going to have my kids do pen and paper. Like, sure, you could do that, but it might not be what's best for kids. It might be what's easiest for me, right? Um, but it might not be what's best for kids. So, yeah. I think that's a really good point. Like, you know, as our, you know, we can have these teaching philosophies and how we want to do things, but we have to change with the times and the, in the way and meeting our students and knowing our students and how they are learning. And honestly, what a lot of the jobs are going to be once they graduate, like it's going to be very tech focused, mm -hmm. like whether they are in the tech industry or not, they're probably going to have to know some sort of tech or how to use, you know, AI mm -hmm. and chat GPT. And I use it honestly, almost yeah. on the daily now. Yeah. And so it's like, it's just like, it's a part of our lives. And um, with that, I'm just curious if that, you know, obviously social media is now a part of our lives. And that's a lot of how, you know, um, you know, students connect now. I'm just curious if you have, you know, kind of approached that and, you know, helped, you know, youth like be able to connect with each other in, in safe and positive ways. Because I know, obviously, when you are in high school, sometimes, you know, it's way easier to say, you know, and bully via the internet. And I'm just curious what some of those conversations you're having with, with your fellow teachers or also with your students as well. Yeah. I think for me, um, a lot of it comes down to like respecting the, the cell phone policies that are in my building and just, you know, working with fidelity to like, try to come, you know, do, um, like give these kids the same message. Um, but I also think it's really important that just like AI, cell phones aren't going anywhere. Social media is not going anywhere, right? And so it's like, instead of just like yelling at these kids of like, stop TikToking or don't do the like this, that, and the other that's on the trend. It's just like more of like, well, how can I become trendy? You know, or like, how can I share on social media? And for me, that was like, 
I didn't do a lot of social media. I shared a few pictures on Facebook for like great aunt Edna that lives far away. But other than that, I just I wasn't before I became teacher of the year. I wasn't on Twitter. I wasn't on TikTok. And now I'm like, boy, if I want to you know, learn anything and, and there's beauty and, and there's harm in all of it. But it's like I can't teach my kids about this, whether it be my own kids or my students, if I'm not having firsthand experiences. And so I think that was a really important part was to just get that experience um and then just having some some conversations about um you know just having like digital citizenship conversations and understanding um that those are that and i think it's really important that we also remember that like what we as the teachers perceive as like harm or an emergency and what the kids perceive as like five alarm fire are very different. And so like, um, you know, I, I I think that's an important element, especially within social media, because they think like it's a big deal. And then maybe walking them through of like, why maybe this isn't such a big deal or like why making this comment is a big deal and how that is harmful and trying to like just engage in kind of some of those human elements. But I mean, like we talked about earlier, if that foundation isn't built, you're not opening the gate to have those conversations um, and it makes it much harder. And so um, I think of like how you start your first three weeks, like really sets the tone for the rest of the year. So pressure or no pressure. Um, I think that that's just true, you know? So I've been thinking about that. A lot. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Setting that tone at that, at that earlier, you know, onset of the school year of the season or whatever it really may be. And I'm curious, you know, we are going, we are moving forward. Um, and I love that you're kind of integrating, right? Talk, having conversations about social media, integrating, you know, chat GPT and the other obviously softwares that, you know, these students are using. Mm -hmm. um, as we, you know, the final question I'll ask you is, you know, thinking about the, the future um, and a good question I like to ask, you know, some of our guests is like, what is some of the impact that, you know, for the students that you are working with now that you would want them to remember and take with them and then kind of bridge that impact to the next generation later on? Mm -hmm. What, you know, values do you hope they, you know, kind of remember from your teachings? Yeah, I hope what they take away is um, that I had fun, that I was having fun. I want to teach the kids that like learning can be fun and your job can be fun because I think sometimes it's so daunting to think about like, you want me to pick a job and I'm supposed to go there and I like, you know, all that like adulting is so hard and it is, there are hard parts about everything in life but i want the kids to know that like you can pick something it doesn't have to be teaching but you can go and show up every day and it can be fun right and you can start anew the next day all of that um and i really want my kids to also know that like i was always learning i talk about what i'm reading i talk about like what's this new skill that i'm learning and that that came far before i was teacher of the year i have a lot of opportunities now for, for, for excuse me professional development um, but I was seeking those before and learning new things. And whether that be like YouTube taught me how to crochet a blanket for my kids, or I made, you know, little crocheted animals and just like, show, you know, teaching them about that or um, that just like I was trying new things or I'll tell them like, okay, guys, I read this blog and they did this new activity. We're going to try it out today. Like this is called the wagon wheel or whatever it is. And it might be great and it might not, but let's, let's give it a go. And so just kind of like being vulnerable and honest. And so, um, that's what I hope to keep going for myself, um, to like longevity, make it as a teacher for many, many years, um, and to keep the joy and also to like the big takeaways that I hope the kids get. Yeah, keep the joy, have fun and, and be vulnerable and honest. I think that's, you know, a great, you know, wisdom to pass along to, to your students. So thank you so much for your time today. Where is a good place that, you know, the listeners can find and connect with you? And I also know that you have a couple books and you got workshops and speaking yeah. engagements if they want to, you know, connect with you more. Yeah, so I can be found on Twitter at Renee Jones Teach. Um, and I also have a website, same same thing, uh, ReneeJonesTeach.com, and you can kind of see like where am I speaking at? What, what you know, what are, what are we up to? Um, so yeah, most easily, that's kind of like all my connections are are there. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We will drop those links in the show description below, and have a great one. Awesome! Thank you so much.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts, and this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward, make an impact on the world. So, Stay tuned, stay subscribed, cheers.